All righty, let's see what chapter 13 is all about. As you can see here, we've got a very different title because right? we've got a big shift in ideas going on now for chapters 13 and 14. Whereas previously, everything was largely based around chemical synthesis and learning reactions, 13 and 14 get to the question of how do we know what we actually made in a lab? Right? We need tools to determine structure, which is another fundamental part of organic chemistry. So you'll see these topics are a little bit different, right? determining those structures. Uh, in chapter 13, we cover a couple of techniques. We'll spend two videos talking about mass spectrometry, two or three videos talking about infrared spectroscopy, IR, and then finish the chapter with one video at the end talking about UV vis, ultraviolet visible spectroscopy. The very first step for any of these things is to actually isolate your product and purify it, right? You can distill it or recrystallize or do some chromatography, but then we get into the actual characterization. Okay? So we've got these techniques that we talked about and we'll talk about further for chapter 13. And then in chapter 14, we will cover nuclear magnetic resonance, NMR. And so we'll save that later. These are the three that we're going to be covering in chapter 13. Mass spec first, which will give us some information about molar mass and molecular formula. IR will tell us what functional groups we have present a lot of the time. UV vis will give us some information about conjugated systems. And you see, there's no one technique that gives you everything. And so often combinations of these techniques are used together to complement one another. So we'll look at each one of them in turn, starting with mass spec. And it's gonna be important as we go through this that you remember your functional groups. Most of these we've gotten reactions of already, okay? Lesser extent for what we've got over here. These chapters are still to come. Okay? But <clears throat> make sure you know the functional groups that are on this table. Moving forward, I will expect you to know all of these. Okay, so quickly know if I say an ester, for example, you know what kind of functional group is present there. Okay. So we've got mass spec first. Okay, here's a couple of Im images that aren't in the textbook okay, to show you what the instrument actually looks like if you were to see this in a lab. Okay. Uh, we are studying mass spectrometry. The instrument is called a mass spectrometer, okay, like spectrometer. And they work, it's a destructive technique, meaning you can't get your product back. Okay, so if you're working with something expensive, that's not ideal. And sometimes it's necessary. The destructive technique where it takes a small amount of your product and it vaporizes it and ionizes it to give us some information as we said about the molecular formula. Okay. That process is known as electron ionization which is what this slide is showing us, electron ionization. So you might see this as EI mass spec. Okay? So EI is electron ionization, where you hit the molecule, as you see there with the electron beam, which is high energy electron, 70 electron volts or more. And the electron beam has so much kinetic energy that a lot of your molecular ions, as we'll see, end up breaking apart, it's called fragmentation. We'll go into cations, radicals, some neutral molecules, and even some radical cations. And when that happens, the bonds that are most likely to break are the ones that are the weakest, yep. and they tend to lead to more stable products. Yep. The question is, how do we detect them? We'll get to that next. Um, one thing to take away from here, right, we see here, to start mass spec anyway, we are just kicking off one electron. The electron has been ejected from the initial compound and it forms a molecular ion. So that has an unpaired electron and a positive charge overall, it's the molecular ion. It has the same mass as your molecule would have at the beginning. The molecular ion is what's first produced. Okay, so no molecular ion. We'll cover that again in just a second. Get into the question of how these things are detected. Only positively charged species get detected at the end of the day, reach the actual recorder in the computer, right? Because your positively charged fragments are what get drawn down between these magnets, these negatively charged plates, which then accelerate 
down this tube and notice it's curved, right? And the magnetic field deflects those positively charged species in a curved path, and they'll vary depending on their mass to charge ratio, which we'll cover next, mass to charge ratio, M over Z. If they're not positively charged, right, then they get kicked out right here in the vacuum pump. Okay, so you see neutral molecules or negative ions, they get lost. It's only positively charged stuff that gets accelerated down and detected by the recorder at the end of the day. Okay. And again, see we've got different particles here deflected according to their mass to charge ratio M over Z, which is a really important part of mass spec, knowing the mass to charge ratio. Now, usually the charge is just plus one. Okay. So the mass to charge ratio, right, if it's mass over plus one, mass to charge is equal to the overall mass, just keeping in mind that it has to be positively charged in order to be detected. And we're recording these masses in AMUs, or atomic mass units. Smaller mass to charge ratios bend more than that of heavier fragments. Okay? They are more uh, sensitive to the magnetic field. So if you need to have giant chunks that are passing through okay, big fragments, you increase the strength of the magnet. And at the end of the day, if the path matches the curvature of the analyzer tube, it goes all the way through the tube without getting ejected and exits out of the ion slit and gets detected. Yep. And the collector then records the relative number of fragments with that particular mass to charge ratio that's passing through the slit and being detected. Okay. The more stable these things are, the more likely they are to make it all the way and be detected. But the big question is, and the big focus for the chapter is, what's the output look like? And how do I actually analyze this thing? How do I read this chart that's given to me? Okay. For chapter 13 and chapter 14, I'm less concerned with knowing the exact specifics of the technique and more concerned with knowing that you, know, you can actually go through and read these things. It's called a mass spectrum. Okay. This is the mass spectrum of pentane, C5H12. And what a mass spectrum is, is a graph of relative abundance of each fragment plotted against its mass to charge ratio. See relative abundance on the Y, mass to charge on the X, which we just covered mass to C approximates the mass because Z is equal to plus one. Again, only positive species. Okay? And every single compound in the world, every single different molecule has a unique mass spectrum. Okay. You can think about it like a fingerprint. So if this thing is a known compound, you can compare your mass spectrum to a literature database, provided there's no impurities in there. Okay. But as you can see, there's a lot of things in here to interpret. Okay. So what's the first thing that you know? Well, we talked about the molecular ion first. Okay. The molecular ion peak you can see as the heaviest peak. That will tell you the molecular mass of the compound. Ignore right now that tiny peak of 73. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Okay, but the largest peak you see, molecular ion. Okay, we know we have a molar mass of 72 AMU. We also have something known as the base peak. Okay, that's just whatever peak it has the largest reading. Okay, so the base peak is the highest fragment in the greatest abundance. So know the difference between those, right? Know what a base peak is, know what a molecular ion peak is. The molecular ion, as we spoke to before, right, the peak with the highest mass to charge ratio, that's the ion that's just lost one electron and has not fragmented, right? We did not break it apart. And it's reported to the nearest whole number. And we are not dealing with actual weighted atomic averages anymore, like we would read off of the periodic table for carbon and hydrogen. So notice it's reported to the nearest whole number. And notice as well that the molecular ion is shown in brackets okay, as a radical cation because we don't know what bond actually broke to give us the electron. Could be any one of those carbon to hydrogen bonds in there. Okay, So we just assume it came from somewhere in there. We don't know where, that's fine. Put it within brackets. And we use the molecular ion to determine the molecular mass of our product. And then going back and looking at the mass spectrum, 72 is my molecular ion peak. Everything else below that is a fragment. Okay. But the way things fragment 
gives you information about the structure, which is the neat part about mass spec. Okay. So I also spoke to the base peak. Okay. Whatever peak is tallest is called the base peak, has the highest relative abundance. Okay. That tends to be the most stable fragment because it's getting detected the most right, and is assigned a relative abundance of 100%. So when you're looking at a mass spec, something's always assigned 100% and every other peak is adjusted to be set to that. Okay. So know the difference between the base peak, whichever is the tallest, and the molecular ion peak, whatever is the heaviest. Okay. And again, the peak heights for everything else, right? That's 57, 29, 27. Right? The relative abundance of those fragments depends on the bond strength that broke to give them and their stability, which provides information in and of itself, okay? which is what all the text on this slide is telling us. Okay, the mass to charge values and the relative abundances of the fragments depend on the strength of the bonds, okay? Because weaker bonds are gonna break easier and have more stable fragments. Okay, which I guess I was getting ahead of myself because that's what this part of the slide says. You know by now that weak bonds break in preference to strong bonds, right? And given the same strength of bond, whatever forms more stable fragments will preferentially break than that that forms less stable fragments. So to see what I mean by that, let's look at pentane, which has a bunch of different possibilities. Okay. Now, all the carbon-carbon bonds are the same strength, of course, right? but the products that they give when they break are different. So the more stable the products we make, the more abundant that type of fragmentation will be. Okay. So look at the radicals and the cations that are formed. Down here for a C1, C2 fragmentation, we form right, a methyl cation and a methyl radical and a primary carbocation and a primary radical. Right? Those aren't as stable. Right? Now notice nowhere in here am I forming secondary or tertiary. We know that those are more stable, right? but forming a methyl carbocation or methyl radical, that's the least stable type you can form. Okay? So C2, C3 fragmentation, right, breaking the bond in here, which is the same as breaking the bond over here, if you think about it in 3D, okay, is always preferred because then at least you're only forming primary and you avoid forming a methyl cation. Okay? So it's still not great, but it's the best that we can get breaking a carbon-carbon bond for n-pentane like this. Okay? So we're gonna preferentially form two primary things, cations and radicals versus a primary and a methyl. Okay. And notice again on this slide, right? it's only the positively charged things that are given an MZ value because those are the only things that are detected. The radicals are neutral, so they get pumped out. They don't hit the detector. Okay. So I think that covers everything in here. More stable fragments that are formed, more abundant they appear on your mass spectrum, so the peaks will be higher. And so we can explain some of the peaks that we have on our fragmentation pattern. An MZ of 15 right, was 15 corresponds to CH3, right? 12 from carbon and three from hydrogen. So if you see a peak at 15, then that means it's a methyl carbocation. But anything that's lost 15, right, means we've cleaved off a methyl group. Same thing for 29, which corresponds to ethyl. That means that we've lost an ethyl radical. Okay? So if you notice, right, if we go back and look at our mass spectrum here, the highest peak is 43, M minus 29. That means we had our original 72 minus 29. It fragmented and lost an ethyl group. And what's left behind, the primary cation, is 43. That is what corresponds to this right here. That's the most stable fragment at the base peak. Okay. So you look for these things all the time. 15, right? 29 is another one, right? and then losing 43 as well if you lose a propyl. Really commonly seen, okay? both those peaks and the MZ of whatever your molecular ion is, 72 for pentane minus, those numbers. It's really easy to lose ethyl groups and lose methyl groups. 
You'll also occasionally see your molecular ion minus two losing two hydrogens and forming a pi bond. Okay, that's what we see right here. So if you see that, it gives you a little bit more information. Not as useful as the other bits, though, to be honest. Okay. But again, the fragmentation will tell you information about the structure because pentane isn't the only way to do C5H12, right? We could have isopentane instead. And like I said, every mass spectrum is unique to a specific molecule. Pentane and isopentane have different mass spectrums. Okay? For isopentane, the peak at 57 is most abundant because look at that, it's a secondary carbocation. Okay? So we still have the same molecular ion peak at 72 okay? because they're both isomers of C5H12, but the fragmentation pattern is different. That giant 57 there is clue that we're dealing with isopentane instead of just N, linear pentane. Okay. So even though we have both got a molecular ion at 72, fragmentation patterns will give me information about the structure. Okay. And then other techniques can confirm it. So how do we calculate molecular formula? That's how we finish this chapter, or the, sorry, not this chapter, it's a long chapter, that's how we finish this video. Okay. Now, in order to quickly calculate the molecular formula using mass spec only, you first have to know the functional groups that are present. So you could do IR and get that information, or on a test, I will tell it to you or give you the information to determine it. Okay. So you need to know whatever functional groups are present. Okay. Then what you do is determine what's known as the base value. Okay. And actually, the the textbook doesn't do a great job right here. So what you do is you take your value for your molecular ion, and first you subtract out anything that's not carbon or hydrogen. Okay. So if you had an amine, for example, you would pull out 14. You would subtract 14 because that corresponds to nitrogen. If you had an alcohol, you would subtract 16 for oxygen. Okay. So subtract out anything that's not carbon or hydrogen. Then that gives you your base value, which you divide by 13. And when you round that number down, that tells you the number of carbons that you have present. Then take your remainder and add it to the number of carbons you determined. And that tells you your number of hydrogens. So we'll illustrate this with an example. If you know your molecular ion peak is at 74, okay, then how do we determine the molecular formula? Okay. Well, the key thing is I have to, as I mentioned, I have to know what other functional groups are present. So it's an ester. And you either remember what an ester is or you quickly look it up, right? An ester has two oxygens as part of it. 16 AMUs each, right? So we take 74 minus 32, and that equals 42 AMUs. Yep. So the 32 that I subtracted out now took care of the two oxygens. Now I take my 42 and I divide it by 13. 42 divided by 13. My calculator works that out to be 3.2307. So I round that down. That tells me that I've got three carbons. Now, 13 goes into 42 three times, right? So I had a remainder of three. I add that to my three original carbons, three plus three, and that tells me my number of hydrogens. Oh, sorry. So I took my remainder, which was three, added it to my number of carbons, which was three. That tells me I have six hydrogens. Yep. So my molecular formula is C3H6O. Two, because I have to original, remember those two oxygens I pulled out. Okay. So that could be something like methyl acetate, right? You don't know the exact structure. You would need more information to do that. But at least now we know the molar mass and we know the molecular formula just by using mass spec. So that technique that we just did, you'll have a couple on your homework for practice, a couple in the textbook I recommend you check out for practice as well. That's a huge part of chapter 13, doing that to determine the formula. That wraps up this video. In the next one, we'll talk about isotopes and that weird tiny peak that was an extra AMU heavier in mass spec.
and some other things to look out for, but make sure you know how to use that rule of 13 and the information that a mass spec gives us. Know the molecular ion peak, know the base peak, and we'll get some more in our next installment.